Welcome to Forum 360, to our global outlook with a local view. I'm Leslie Unger, your host today. I often turn to a dictionary to define or describe something I know, but don't know how to define it or explain it. As a communication coach, I say that each of us has to be able to discover, define, and discuss our own value. But it also protects our value to be able to define and discuss important concepts like today's topic, implicit bias. What is implicit bias? Thoughts and feelings are implicit if we are unaware of them or mistaken about their nature. We have a bias when, rather than being neutral, we have a preference for or aversion to a person or group of people. Thus, we use the term implicit bias to describe when we have attitudes towards people without our conscious knowledge. Our implicit biases often predict how we'll behave more accurately than our conscious values. Today, we have a special guest and an interesting guest, Marvin Ferguson, to weigh in on and help us understand the concept of implicit bias and why we should care. Welcome to Forum 360. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you yeah. for having me. You, you kind of turned on a light bulb for me and mm. made a concept that, you know, just didn't, I couldn't get my, my hands around. You kind of made it really come to life. So I thank you for that, and we are going to get to that in just a few minutes. But I want to start with chronologically your journey. For sure. Because I think that your journey kind of will help us understand implicit bias even better when we kind of understand your perspective. Sure. And the stories that you're going to share. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, I first want to ask you, how and when did you decide to become a pharmacist? Because when I think about mm -hmm. asking, like, five-year-olds, you know how they ask five-year-olds, yeah. what be when you want to grow up? And mm -hmm. they say a fireman, mm -hmm. right, or a doctor. Like, how many of them say, I want to be a pharmacist? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, great question. Uh, my journey on becoming a pharmacist happened uh, as I was just growing up. Um, my mother uh, had lupus which is an uh, autoimmune disease, and essentially she was on a lot of different medications. And so I remember one trip to the pharmacy, and uh, she had this, this drug interaction going on that you know, uh, was causing her to have some, uh, some symptoms. And uh, no one could figure it out. And I remember going to the pharmacy, and this pharmacist looked at her medications and said, you know, back then, I couldn't remember exactly which one it was. It had a long name. That's all I could remember. Mm -hmm. But that's the medication that's causing it. And so uh, after talking with her doctor, she was taken off the medication. And I think it was a bad rash that she was having. It went away. I thought it was magic. Mm -hmm. I want to be that person that can Interesting. Like, make magic by just looking at all these long words and these medication bottles and be able to like, figure that out. Because nobody else could. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I became a pharmacist, but that is one of the main ones that I remember coming up as a child. You know, one thing I find really interesting about that, I have a client that's a pediatric surgeon, mm -hmm. and he became a pediatric surgeon because he was like eight and was in the hospital for something. And yeah. that, that just kind of inspired him. Like, you know, so it's interesting that kids can be inspired. And yes. the thing that's really interesting is that it stuck with you. Yes. Because I, I would think that that's a, a, a pretty long road. Yes. <laughs> so it, for you, it wasn't necessarily a role model, unless maybe this pharmacist that provided mm -hmm. the magic. It wasn't so much a role model as it yeah. was, it was experience. watching. Yeah, it was an experience of just seeing that, having that, that knowledge and that background to be able to figure something out that these other healthcare professionals that were in our life uh, was unable to figure yeah. out. So yeah, it's pretty awesome. So you went to Ohio Northern. I did. In Ada, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I was there for a student leadership conference when I was in high school, and it really is in the middle of nowhere. It is. So please, can you remember like your first week or your first quarter or semester? Can you remember what it was like being kind of beamed into yeah. Ada, Ohio? Ada, Ohio was, what I remember, uh, was one street. That's all I can remember. There was a Hardee's and there was a, uh, a bar called the Regal Beagle. Um, everybody, I don't know if everybody remembers Three's Companies, but it was a Regal Beagle and it was a grocery store. I think it was called Dave's Market right down the street. Those are the only three things I can remember on the main street. And essentially, Ada was Ohio Northern. You know what I mean? That was the main reason people came there. 
Um, so me coming there was definitely, you know, driving past cornfields was just like, where am I going? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as I think back, I think, well, I'm glad that I was in such a place. It's a lot better now, but I didn't have anything to, it wasn't no really partying for that much because there wasn't a lot of things going on. So I, it helped me to stay focused. Now, you know? I don't think of Ada as being the most um, diverse area mm -hmm. in the world, right. but um, because they have the pharmacy yeah. school, did, did that provide more diversity? Or was uh, there a lack of diversity? There was a, a lack, definitely a lack of diversity in Ada, Ohio as itself, but as in for the pharmacy school, mm -hmm. um, there was uh, maybe two of us that I remember. Um, that a lot of people came to the pharmacy school uh, and a lot of people left. And so uh, it was difficult. Everybody was in their own little kind of cliques. So um, there were cliques of people that had, you know, answers to tests and, well, you know, um, being able to study guides to test from, from, from past other students or whatnot. And they kept that to themselves. And so um, it was always, you know, difficult to try to you know compete with that at sometimes you know and i didn't really realize that until later on that there were these different kind of uh separations or segregations of different students and so with me and the uh, actually he was my roommate um pharmacy student and uh you know we just did our best that we could to try to you know get get those grades to be able to pass it through those diff different courses so um yeah definitely was a lack of diversity definitely was difficult um, not seeing people that look like you, not seeing professors that look like you, not having friends um, there, not having a culture mm -hmm. that you're used to, um, is difficult. You know, I look at the positives that it kept me looking straight because I wasn't distracted by anything else, but it was hard. Mm -hmm. it, it was definitely hard. Um, and there was a lot of people, there, a lot of students there, they didn't see people that looked like me. You know, um, I'm not a little guy, <laughs> so, you know, um, coming around and like, what's going on? And then me being in a pharmacy school, also weird, right? For a lot of people, like, well, how'd you get here? I had, remember a uh, person that asked me, was there a special school you went to? Um, indicating that because of my race, that I had to go to a special school for people that look like me in order to make it in okay. pharmacy. And so like, just those, Unconscious, we, you know, we're talking about implicit that's bias. bias. Those right. That's something called a, uh, um, a microaggression. And essentially those are just things people say that they don't realize how they land on people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, to circle back to your question, yeah, there was a, it was a difficult time for me. Um, like I said, I tried to think about the positives that it helped me get through because, you know, I wasn't distracted by a lot of partying because there was not no partying. Well, everybody else was, I guess, but there was nothing really for me. A lot of those different situations and places I went to, I wasn't felt welcome, you know. Um, and so I knew better not to go certain places or be in certain groups or whatever the case may be um, because something may or may not be said. And I just chose not to be in those spaces. Now, as you become a pharmacist, but then apparently that's not enough for you because you have all these initials after your name. <laughs> so if you would explain, take a minute to explain, you've got RPH, PMSP, LSSGB, like you've got this alphabet soup of initials. <laughs> Just in, in a minute, can you explain, is that additional education? Um, what, what are those meaning? Absolutely. Just some additional education and certification. So uh, I went back to get my MBA in 2010, essentially looking at uh, creating a business uh, uh, platform or structure so that I could have a better understanding because I have several businesses as well and being able to understand that um, the, uh, they have my green belt, which is a Lean Six Sigma certification, which uh, basically looks at process improvement. So going into companies or situations and looking what's the best way that this can be done. Um, it started at, by, in Toyota. It goes all the way back there, but we've learned that it can be used for all different systems and all different types of companies and situations. So. Um, that, that changed my life because I use that all the time. Like, what's the easiest way that I can do this? 
what's the most efficient way that I can do this? So it's a whole type of basically concept of just thinking. Um, and then um, the, I got my pain management specialty certification. So my background is in clinical programs, more specifically on opioid case management. So we're all aware of the opioid epidemic. Yes. Um, essentially in my role, we do case management and basically manage patients that are at risk for an opioid overdose based off their current medication regimen. So the pain man management specialty certification just gives me more education so that I can recognize these patients and be able to uh, manage and treat them better. Now we add to that, if you would just quickly answer, we've got Ask a Pharmacist, mm -hmm. Let's Get Healthy, Jamaican Confusion Food <laughs> Truck. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> let's just, let's round you out there. Yes. And um, so uh, I wanna know when you sleep, but for just uh, in a sentence, Ask a Pharmacist. Yes, so Ask a Pharmacist is a radio show on a radio free network that highlights the healthcare professionals in the area. And so I'll have them on and we'll talk about what they do, uh, why it's important, how they got to where they are. So, so far we've had a speech language ther therapist that I didn't even know anything about and they do just wonderful things. Um, we had a cardiologist, we've had uh, uh, um, just all different types of healthcare professionals. I even had someone uh, from uh, a yoga studio, Blue Sage Yoga, talk about the, um, the importance of yoga and meditation especially now with everything going on, just centering yourself um, and just being able to kind of get your, your, your mind and your body aligned. So uh, yeah, that's something that I do. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll look at different disease states. So I'll have a, a, a show focused on blood pressure. I have a show focused on diabetes, and we'll just kind of go through. You need you know, one on diabetes and a dog. I'm going to die <laughs> with that dog that is really a tough journey. I need, I need a show on diabetes oh, and a dog. Oh, man, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. Because I'm sure there's a lot of food that doesn't really It's the help. pancreatitis that is mm. the real challenge, more okay. than the diabetes, I have learned. It's the pancreatitis mm. is my daily arch enemy. Pancreatitis, wow. So when you want to do a show on it, just let me know, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, be, know. I'll be listening. Um, uh, just take a minute, the Jamaican food truck I found so interesting. Yes, that's, that's a great story. So uh, I'm originally from Jamaica, uh, St. Elizabeth Parish, uh, came over to the States uh, with my mom and she had wanted to open up a Jamaican restaurant. Of course, she liked to cook. Um, and uh, as I stated before, she got lupus. So back then, um, they didn't manage lupus well. They basically told her that she couldn't do any of this, you know. Um, and so there's that dream kind of um, went down the drain a little bit. And then also my, my feeling about Jamaican food changed. Um, I couldn't stand it at first because my mom cooked it all the time. time. You know, you so wanted I'm cheeseburgers and Taco exactly. Bell. Exactly. Right? I wanted these, these, these cheese, cheeseburgers. <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> and then my mom was terrible at making American food. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember uh, she used to make spaghetti with ketchup. Ah. No tomato sauce. No, just it was noodles, meat, and ketchup. ketchup. And that's what I had growing up. I went to someone's house for some occasion and they had made spaghetti. Imagine when I tasted that, how I felt like, what is this? They're like, this is spaghetti. No, no. it's not. <laughs> um, and so like, just growing up, just not disliking this food. And it wasn't until I got older and I started doing some traveling and I realized this Jamaican influence is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Caribbean, I should just say Caribbean because mm -hmm. a lot of it is aligned. And so my love started to kind of come back for Jamaican food. And so I remember I came across, I see her business plans. She went to a, I don't know if any, anybody on this watching remember the Mansfield Business College, but it was an old business college. Mm -hmm. They've since gone away. But I remember her business plan. And I was like, you know what? Um, I'm gonna do this for her. And so uh, there was a couple dishes that uh, I tested out with my daughter. I was like, well, how do you like this? How do you like this? She's like, I like it, I like it. And those are the dishes that are my main stage things for my trailer. So I go all around. Yeah, last year was my first year, but I had a chance to be at the Hall of Fame, um, the Black College Hall of Fame. 
Um, I've had different places around Akron that I went, went to a TEDx in Columbus mm -hmm. and served them. Um, so I've been blessed with the opportunities that I've had to be open just my first year. Everybody loves the food, but they say once you're, you have love in the food, everybody else is going to love it as well. So, um, yes, yes. So that's the food truck. That is the food truck. It T is. Today we are going to talk about implicit bias with our guest, Marvin Ferguson. Okay, so let's take a look at implicit bias. Now we yes. know your journey and you know that you, even if you didn't know the term when you were in college, that you've kind of experienced it yes. your whole life. Mm -hmm. um, when I heard your, your TEDx talk, it was one of the first times I had heard the word. Your stories made it come to life for me. Mm -hmm. So first, can you tell us from your point of view what implicit bias is? And then maybe you can tell us maybe the cough syrup or the pain medicine yes. football player story. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so you said it well at the beginning. Uh, implicit bias are your unconscious attitudes or feelings about a certain race or population of people. Um, I think when it becomes difficult or problematic is when power is attached to it. So essentially power is basically someone has the, the authority to cause or change or do harm, right? And so uh, if we go to some of the examples I used during my TEDx talk, I talked about, uh, I used to play uh, semi-pro football. Um, and so uh, I was probably one of the oldest people out there. But you couldn't tell me anything back then. <laughs> um, and so during one game, I dislocated my shoulder. And, uh, and that really hurts. <laughs> I had a dislocated shoulder, and that really, really hurts. Yes. Which is important to the story. Right. But, you know, I actually, I remember, it was that Saturday. And I remember I went back to work that Sunday, and I had my arm in a sling and everything. That's when I work retail, you know. Um, and so after work, I went to have my, the doctor had my prescription at a different pharmacy. And so I went to go pick up my pain prescription. Now, this is a pharmacist going to pick up a prescription right. from another pharmacy, <laughs> right. correct? Right. Okay. So, I mean, I go in there and I don't have my smock on, so he doesn't know I'm a pharmacist, of course. And so I, I go to pick up my prescription. The pharmacist is ringing me up. And I'm looking at my bottle, and I remember the doctor calling, said he was going to call in a quantity of 20, and there was only 10 in the bottle. And so I said, hey, can you go check the prescription? Um, I think this is wrong. And so uh, the pharmacist goes to, to check the prescription and uh, says, hey, you know, that's what your doctor called in. But uh, <laughs> as he starts to walk to the counter, he, like, starts to smile. And I was like, okay. Um, and he's like, well, you won't need that full prescription. You people take pain well. And so, um, you know, my eyes kind of grew wide and I was like, excuse me? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you know, I think he thought he was giving me, you know, a compliment. And then when he realized my re reaction, he just said, oh, you're a big guy. You don't, you know, um, you won't need that full prescription. But essentially, there is this, this thought that African Americans have a higher pain tolerance than the other population. There's been studies, many studies that show, there's a 2015 study in JAMA that looks at uh, one million emergency room visits of uh, children admitted for appendicitis. Mm -hmm. And it showed that uh, only one-fourth the African American children actually receive opioid painkillers although they were admitted or taken to the ICU for the same reason. And so there's been study upon study upon study upon study that just proved this. So when we talk about implicit bias, and we talk about power, so the implicit bias is the association that because I look like I do, that I have a higher pain tolerance. The power is a physician or someone that is caring for me that makes that assumption. And so now I'm in pain or I don't get the same type of pain relief that someone else does because of what I look like. So that's when implicit bias becomes uh, harmful um, when those type of situations happen. And, you know, the other story, and, you know, as a communication coach, I, I hear a lot of speeches, I hear a lot of presentations. Right. I don't remember, you know, many, many, many of them. Yeah. I remember the cough syrup. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and I remember <laughs> the painkiller, you know, because stories are such a great way to connect with people. Yes. And so please share your cough syrup yes. story. Yes. You know, 
I'll be honest with you, I didn't tell anybody about that story. Um, and I wasn't going to. Um, I think that I was sharing it with someone when I was trying to get this TEDx uh, talk together. And it was like, you should say that. And I'm like, because I didn't do that. It just, it just hurt me so bad. But to get into it, uh, as a pharmacy intern, um, I was working uh, at a pharmacy. It was in a... Um, um, it was in a, it was a black neighborhood. Uh, actually, I uh, went to the church right down the street. And so I like working there. There was a lot of people from my church and friends that came in there. Um, so it was, it was good. You know, I didn't have a problem working there. So it was cough and cold season. And I remember uh, ringing up one of the patients, and it was a, uh, it was a cough syrup for a child. And uh, I went to the back of the pharmacy to uh, fill the prescription. Cough syrups usually stuff back there. And I realized we didn't have enough to fill the order. And so uh, I went to the pharmacist and uh, said, hey, you know, we don't have enough to fill this prescription. And uh, he just real, just said real calmly, just, just put some, some water in it. And, you know, um, you know, I, I took a step back and was like, you know, excuse me? Like, what, like just put some water on it, it's fine. Like, it seems so comfortable for him. But just the backstory is, I worked with this pharmacist before in other pharmacies. He was always annoyed at this pharmacy. He never waited or even really looked at any of the patients at this pharmacy. And so, uh, really had a problem being there. And other pharmacies I worked with him at, these weren't issues. And so, um, yeah, I wasn't going to share that with anyone um, because it was just, it, 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 I don't know if you ever had a situation that was hard for you to believe, and so you just basically you try to forget about mm -hmm. it. Like, I can't believe it just happened to me. I had one in elementary school. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> and it was probably 20 or 25 years before I told anyone. I know exactly what you mean. But yes. let me ask you, how do you align a seemingly honest pharmacist who took an oath to yeah. do no harm, how do you align that with the conscious decision to change that cough syrup? How do I align it with the... Uh, well, in, in his mind, he took uh, an oath to say, to, to do no harm. H how how, how do those two things exist in the same person's mind? You know, I don't know what was going through his mind. Only thing I could come up with is he didn't see these patients the same way he saw his other patients. And so when there's this unconscious behavior like, well, these aren't the same as other people that I've deal with, so I can basically do or say or treat them a certain type of way because of maybe some kind of unconscious beliefs that I have about this population. Now, when you go back to pharmacy school at in Ada, Ohio. <laughs> Were there any classes then, or do you know if there are any classes now mm -hmm. in implicit bias or in any way, any way you want to address it, diversity yeah. of patients? Do you know if there's anything more being done today for, for people that are in school now? So at Ohio Northern, no. You know, there was nothing that, uh, that prepared us as pharmacists to face those populations. Today, yes, I'm actually on a, uh, uh, a focus group or a board there at Oneomed, at Neomed, mm -hmm. uh, to look at these problems, look at these issues, mm -hmm. look at these gaps. So they're looking at things as far as uh, look at having more preceptors that have different, uh, that look like some of the students, more of the students. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the curriculum, what kind of curriculum? Because what's important is being able to share with healthcare professionals that all your population isn't going to be one fit, right? There are going to be challenges that they may not share with you. You know, so for example, if, I, if I'm trying to work with someone to help them lose weight, and they say, well, you can go walking and you can do these different things. Well, if they don't have safe sidewalks to walk mm -hmm. on, if they live in a food desert, you know, all these different challenges, everybody's not going to come up and just say, actually, doctor, I, I don't have sidewalks. Actually, there's only a liquor store and a gas station by my house. And there's no real store that I can get fresh fruits, fruits or vegetables. You know what I mean? So those are different things that we have to take into consideration when we're talking to patients about being more healthy. They may not have access to these sure. different things.
One last question I have to ask. Our time has gone by so fast, okay. but I have to ask one last question in a yes. couple words. Yes. The best thing about having a teenage daughter. Yes, I remember you asking me that. Um, I would say the, the best thing is being able to have conversations with her about what she's going to be when she grows up. Okay. We learned today, and maybe a pharmacist, we learned today that implicit bias is a universal phenomenon, not limited by race, gender, or even country of origin. Why does it matter? Implicit bias can affect cough syrup or pain medication at your local pharmacy. If it can affect meds, think about how it can affect our world in the smallest and biggest ways. We learned today that most of our actions occur without our conscious thoughts, allowing us to function in our extraordinarily complex world. This means that our implicit biases often predict how we'll behave and more accurately than our conscious values. Our guest, Margaret Ferguson, reminds us of being mindful. And um, I'm Leslie Unger for Forum 360. Thank you for joining us today. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.